Hello and welcome to today's virtual Coffee Talk webinar. My name is Margaret and I'll be your web host today. I have a few housekeeping announcements and then I will introduce our speakers. In order to earn CPE credit for today's session, please stay connected to the webcast for the entire program and participate by responding to at least three of the four interactive questions. Second, there will be a course evaluation which will open in a new window upon exiting the webcast at the end of the program. And with that, I'll introduce our speakers. Firstly, we have Kevin Jacobs, a Managing Director with Alvarez and Marcel Taxon in Washington, D.C. and the National Tax Office Practice Leader. He brings more than 15 years of experience in tax matters in both the public and private sector. Secondly, Patrick Blanchard, a Managing Director at Alvarez and Marcel, whose experience is focused on assisting clients with a variety of issues related to qualified retirement plans. He assists clients with their non-qualified deferred compensation plans and other compensation programs to ensure the compliance with all applicable statutes and guidance. Next, Matthew, Matthew Gruner, par partner at Bracewell, who ad advises clients on a broad range of compensation and employee benefits matters for public and closely held companies, as well as private equity funds and portfolio companies. And finally, from Walters Clear Tax and Accounting, we have Kevin DeYoung, a sales and business development manager. He will be showing us today how to find additional answers and resources using CCH Answer Connect. Thank you. And now, Kevin, take it away. Great, thanks so much. And, and thanks everyone for joining today's virtual coffee talk. We've had over the past virtual coffee talks discussions about legislation that has passed and a lot of it has focused on um, discussions, including the most recent um, Inflation Reduction Act. And we've talked about possibly, you know, the implications of excise tax and, and the CAMTI. Today, we're actually gonna talk on um, a different, provision, which is Secure 2.0, which is impacting a host of, of comp and benefit areas. And so today's agenda um, is actually really interesting from the aspect of there's things that people should know about, um, both from a planning perspective for what's coming, as well as decisions that might need to be made or should be made now. Um, with that said, I'm very excited that Matt and Patrick have, have joined me today. Um, today, we're going to talk about, you know, giving a broad overview of what happens, uh, what is Secure 2.0, what are the practical impacts, so that way you can walk away saying, okay, I understand what I should know, or at least the, the starting point of what I should know on Secure 2.0, the next steps, and then as always, if you have questions, feel free to enter them in, and if we have time, we'll, we'll answer them. Um, with that, we're going to launch our first polling question, and... Uh, as a reminder, please enter, answer the questions. You need to answer at least three to, in order to receive your CPE certificate. Um, have you started implementing the updates required by Secure 2.0? Um, yes, we're ahead of the game. No, but we've started making a game plan to do so. Or what is Secure 2.0? With that, while the polling question is still open, Matt, why don't we start talking about Secure 2.0 and, and giving everyone an overview? Thanks, Kevin. So yeah, just to uh, level set a little bit, um, as, as many will recall, back in late 2019, Congress passed the Setting Every Community Up for Enhancement, or the SECURE Act, which made a lot of changes in the retirement area. And shortly thereafter, Congress came back uh, thinking, well, you know, there's probably more changes to be made. Uh, and so the discussions were started literally two months after the SECURE Act was passed. And then finally, in December of last year, SECURE 2.0 came in. Um, you know, these laws are, they stack on top of one another. One thing that you will see throughout this presentation is that there are changes that SECURE 2.0 makes to the SECURE Act. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that both of these laws are intended to work together to enhance retirement plan availability. Uh, so we've got things like uh, participation for long-term uh, part-time, long-term part-time employees, excuse me, uh, automatic uh, enrollment for participants for new plans becoming mandatory. Uh, just a lot of changes. The Secure 2.0 has roughly 90 provisions in it. Um, so it's a lot to pay attention to. Uh, it, again, it was effective uh, December, 29th, December 29th, 2022. There are some provisions that became effective immediately and some phase in in 2022, 23, 24, 25. 
uh, it reaches well out into the future. So kind of an all-encompassing uh, and, and relatively complex law. So if we move to our next slide, uh, which is the timeline and highlighted changes, this lays out what I just discussed about how we have changes that are coming in over time. And I would just point out uh, a couple, particularly the ones that we're going to be talking about today. So immediately upon enactment of Secure 2.0, there were changes to EPCRS, which is the IRS's correction program for retirement plans. Um, you know, Roth treatment of, uh, of employer contributions became immediately available, although kind of the general thought in the the retirement plan community is nobody's quite sure how to make those work. Uh, we've got RMD changes that come in in 2023. There's been a lot of movement in that area. If you'll recall, before the SECURE Act, uh, the, ret the retirement age was 70 and a half. SECURE changed it to 72. SECURE 2.0 changes it to 73. And in fact, in another 10 years, it changes it back to up to 75. Um, in 2024, we get the student loan matching. Uh, 2025 is when the new kind of revised long-term part-time employee uh, provision comes in for participation. And 2025 is also an important year to pay, to pay attention to because that's when all of the amendments uh, under Secure 2.0 are due. And as you can see, we've, we've set this slide up uh, color-coded to try to kind of give an idea of what parties are going to be responsible for various things. But I think ultimately what's going to happen is, is that all of this is going to be uh, an interaction among sponsors, record keepers, third party administrators, payroll providers. Uh, it's, it's pro, you know, ERISA council. Um, it's, it, it is going to take quite a few people to, to get these changes in place and to make sure that they are operating correctly. Hey Matt, this is this is really helpful, and I think the other thing that's worth noting is something that you pointed out, which is Secure 2.0 added on to Secure, and chances are, as we talked about even before this panel started, we anticipate we're not done yet, and so it's highly likely that I won't say there's a Secure 3.0, but the area of law in this area is going to continue to evolve, so people need to stay on top of this. It's not going to say necessarily this is going to be the end all be all, um, but appreciating what what these updates are and staying on top of it uh, is going to be really important. And so it's going to be really a moving target, not only to understand what's coming in as the phase outs as you know, using this this chart is really important and it's really helpful. Um, and it was helpful for me when I was looking at it like, OK, 2023, this is what's happening 2024. But when we're starting to see potential legislation in the coming sessions in Congress, we could say, OK, this is what's coming up. What are they possibly overlaying it? That's absolutely right. Or there's also the possibility we've seen with, you know, with laws like this in the past where they delay effective dates for things because they realize that it's a little more complicated than they thought and they need some more time to work everything out. So let's turn to, I guess, some practical impacts. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so this is Patrick. Um, when we when we've been talking about Secure 2.0, um, one of the things that we've noticed is is that there has been a lot of focus on those impacts that um, are going to be handled by your record keepers, kind of that middle box on this slide, but maybe not as much. Uh, focus on the plan sponsor impacts and the other service uh, providers and how everyone's going to have to coordinate. And so what we've wanted to do and we've been emphasizing with our clients is, is that, okay, it's great that the record keepers are coming up with a plan to implement their pieces, which tends to be around assets and transactions that are in the plans or the plan documents. Um, but what are the other things that we need to do? You know, Matt, I, the, the, the easiest one for me is amendments. You know, uh, record keepers like to assume that they are responsible for the plan document, which they are most of the time, but that's not always the impact. Yeah, so that's, oh, I'm sorry, I was just okay. gonna, gonna say, Patrick, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, typically we do expect the, you know, the large record keepers, the fidelities and such of the world to draft these amendments. Um, they, you know, and they frequently do, but, uh, you know, sometimes the, 
they can uh, th things can get a little a little hairy in terms of who's responsible for what, particularly when you've got amendments. You know, those the record keepers they will do the ones that are automatic, and you know they'll send you the copy and say, look, this is everything that went into effect. You you didn't have a say in this, so we just did it. Uh, it becomes a little bit more complex when you get the documents that have, okay, now you need to start making choices. Uh, you know, do you want to put permissive things in? Or if something is required but has different levels that you could select from, uh, but, you know, the record keepers are not going to provide guidance on that. They're going to expect that plan sponsors, uh, you know, are working with ERISA council um, and any other outside vendors that they may have to figure out what's appropriate for their plan and what's the best way to implement it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what we see, Matt. The other part of the amendments is, like you, like you said, sometimes it's a, this has been implemented, nothing for you to do other than put this in your plan records. Other times it's an amendment that requires execution. And so sometimes, unfortunately, I have had clients that don't realize something requires execution by a certain date because they think it's automatic, and then they blow through that date. So it's, there's going to be that coordination there. Um, the other coordination um, is going to be around the operational changes. There, are, as we're going to see for Secure 2.0, there are a number of things that are change how contributions are calculated on the plan sponsor side, rather than how the money is administered on the record keeping side. And so, for the plan sponsor side, you'll have to see things like payroll get involved, HRIS, sometimes your payroll provider, whether it's ADP, SAP, Oracle, whoever. Um, might be the, the actual provider, and then making sure that um, those things are getting updated so that the contributions are being calculated appropriately and, and the plan is in compliance. Um, again, though, the, the record keepers are out ahead of this, and there's significant responsibility for the record keepers with regard to Secure 2.0. Um, you know, Matt, you mentioned a few of them, the new distribution and withdrawal options, RMDs, cash out limit changes, stuff like that. Um, what we are hearing from the record keepers already is, is that they are internally preparing to be ready to implement these things on their side, which is fantastic because that means that um, from that perspective, a client has to far worry far less, right? The, the RMD one is the easy one. When it goes to 73, the record keeper will take care of that. The, all the plan sponsor will need to do is continue to have the same oversight that they've always had with regard to the RMDs and the record keeper to make sure it's compliant, but they don't necessarily need to be saying to the record keeper, okay, we're moving from 72 to 73 this year. That's going to be automatic. It's just the oversight that needs to happen. Um, right. the, the parts that aren't getting talked about as much, and we aren't hearing from payroll companies at all, are the, again, the operational impact. And that's why we wanted to address it this way with our clients, because we would heard feedback from a couple of clients when we brought it up, that they weren't worried about it because the record keeper wasn't record keeper wasn't worried about it, and just because the record keepers got their part under control doesn't mean that the payroll system has their part under control, you know. And so that's when we go through these the the next several slides and the practical impact. That's what we've really wanted to focus on is what are those things that aren't going to be captured by the record keeper. So the first one, and and I'll let Matt jump into the all the fun that is going to be had here but is changes to catch-up contributions. Yes. All right, so sponsor focus number one, changes to catch-up contributions. The first thing I will say is, is that this is a relatively complex uh, change in the rules. It has multiple changes and they phase in over time. And it also uh, requires the employer to pay a little bit closer attention to the individuals who are making these contributions because we have uh, we have dollar limits that can dictate when and who is uh, able to make these changes. So just kind of as a, a, a general idea, the first thing to say is is that nothing has changed with respect to catch-up contributions for 2023. It is still if you are 50 or over, you can make up to $7,500 in catch-up contributions, and those can be uh, either pre-tax or raw. Uh, starting in 2024, that's when we're going to start seeing the changes. Um, in 2024, individuals who make more than a certain amount 
uh, and make catch-up contributions will be required to make those uh, as Roth. So I always think of the IRS, it, it gives with one hand, um, but it takes with the other. And so this, um, you know, the Roth idea is, okay, well, it's, an, it's it designed to, well, the catch-up is designed to incentivize people uh, to maximize their uh, deferrals right before retirement. Well, the Roth is a revenue raiser. So with the one hand, the IRS has said, okay, we're gonna make this a little bit easier, more friendly for people, we'll raise limits, et cetera. But by the, you know, by the same token, they're also saying, but we're gonna force you to pay tax on it right now. Uh, so if we go yeah. to the next slide. Um, well, yeah, that one. Just and sure from a get... practical impact on the, this first one with the, the Roth treatment, um, step one is to make sure the plan allows for it. And uh, we have some clients who, who don't allow for Roth in their plans at all right now. And so the recommendation we're making is start the process of implementing Roth just so that you can max out the catch-up contributions. You know, next, you know, once you get the Roth implemented, you can start looking at who is um, actually required to have that Roth treatment for catch-up. And Matt, yeah, I think that's on the, the left-hand side here, who, who that applies to, right? Right, right. So in the, you know, under the change next to the, the first arrow, this becomes effective in 2024. There is a dollar limit on people who would still be able to make pre-tax catch-up contributions. And if you have met, if you had uh, wages of more than $145,000 from the employer in the prior year, and those wages are their wages for FICA purposes. So it's not a it's not a plan compensation definition. It's literally a look at the W-2 um, definition. If you're if you exceed that amount, then any catch-up contributions that you make starting in 2024 have to be treated as Roth. And this raises questions of well, what what do you do with new hires? Do new hires just come in as zero, um, you know, irrespective of what they may earn in their first year? That appears to be how the statute is written, is that you will, you, you will not be subject to that limit that forces the Roth until your second year of employment uh, with the company. Uh, and then in 2025, this is the, the second step of the changes. This is where they layer on top of one another this increases the overall catch-up limit for individuals who are between the age of 60 and 63. And what it is, is it is a formula that provides for the greater of $10,000 or 150% of what they refer to as the standard limit. So if we were to assume that the 2023 standard limit of $7,500 carried into 2025, an individual who was between 60 and 63 would be able to make catch-up contributions of $11,250, although I think we ought to expect that that number, that standard limit should rise a little bit over the next two years. Absolutely, and so, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, step one is to make sure the Roth is in the plan at all. Um, once you do that, for that first piece, for the $145,000 uh, threshold that Matt talked about being effective in 2024, that's going to require the employers to use the payroll system to track who is subject to that limit. And because it's the prior year of actual earnings, right at the end of the year or the beginning of 2024, employers are going to have to go through and make sure that they've accurately captured everybody so that they can be uh, Rothifying their catch-up contributions uh, in the appropriate circumstances. Um, even more impactful though, is this last bullet under number one, how to communicate with impacted employees and ensure a smooth transition. By definition, these are going to be employees that are at the higher end of the pay scale for a company. They're the ones that made more than 145,000. There will be a lot of them that just check the box to say they wanna contribute as much as possible. So how are you going to communicate with the employees to make sure they understand that if they want to contribute the maximum amount, whether it be you know 7,500 or the, the 11,000 Matt mentioned in 2025 and forward, part of that might be Roth, and they might not even know whether it's Roth or not when they're making the election, stuff like that. Um, 
that question about how to communicate is really employee population specific. I have some clients that are like, we are not going to roll people into Roth unless we have a conversation with them specifically before we do that. Whereas I have others that are like, that are saying, we'd love to have them just check a box for the Roth that says, I'll get it pre-tax if that's possible and Roth if it's required so that we don't have to be having these conversations. Ultimately though, that's again, dependent on your employee population. So, so look at it, talk to your advisors uh, and your record keeping partners to make sure that everyone feels like the approach that you choose is compliant. Um, as with a lot of things here, we don't have a ton of guidance about what's permissible and what's not. So we, we will be keeping an eye out for that. The other change here is uh, this 150% of the standard limit. <clears throat> for years, we've operated under kind of a binary system. Either an employee is only subject to the normal deferral limit, which this year is 22,500, or it's deferrals plus catch up for this year, $30,000. So it's either 22,500 or 30,000. Now we're adding in additional complexity because it's 22,500, 30,000, or approximately 34,000. So now we had, instead of two options, now we have three options with regard to the amount that, that's permissible as catch up contributions. Um, this will be more complex with the payroll systems because a lot of the payroll systems require manual entry as to the amount of ketchup that, that's permissible. So you might have to go in and uh, monitor the individuals who are eligible for that 60 to 63 increase limit to make sure the payroll system's allowing them to get all the way there. So again, this is a complex one. So on this next slide, we have kind of a, a timeline that, that runs through it. All right, so in the first example, this is for 2023, and as I mentioned, nothing has changed. So in this example, we have an employee who is over 50, so they're catch-up eligible. They make $7,500 in catch-up contributions. And these contributions, the individual can choose um, to characterize them as pre-tax or Roth as that person desires. The next example shows our, our, our first level of change that comes in in 2024. This is where we start having to pay attention to um, FICA wages from the prior year to determine whether or not we have to force catch-up contributions. So we have an employee who's 52 in 2024 and they earn $200,000 from the company in the prior year. So they are over the $145,000 limit and these contributions are required to be treated as Roth. We also have another employee, same age, who only earned $100,000 in 2023. So this person is below the threshold and can make either pre-tax or Roth contributions at their choice. And then Patrick, you wanna... Yeah, so the, the third um, kind of example here is for 2025. And as Matt uh, previously said, that's when we layer on additional requirements. So in 2024, like Matt said, it's the required Roth. In 2025, if we have somebody that's 61 years old, so they're in that 60 to 63 window, and they earn 200,000 with the company in 2024, um, they will get 150% of the normal limit but that entire amount will have to go in as well. So this is the, the piece where we have the, the two different requirements or one requirement and one optional change. Um, increased amounts, but wrong. But if they're 52 in 2025 and only earned 100,000 in 2024, they are kind of under our, our current regime in that they use the regular catch-up limit, but they can choose pre-tax or wrong. And Matt, it sounds like we had a couple questions come in. Um, have you seen any guidance about whether the catch-up contribution um, and Roth treatment is requiring SEPs and SIMPLES to comply with the same kind of regime change? Uh, I have not, but I have to admit that on the SEPs and SIMPLES, I have not paid as close attention to as I have for the 401k plans. Okay. And we'll keep an eye out for that just to see if we do see any changes. I haven't seen anything either. Um, a lot of times they 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 will. 
Um, but I haven't seen whether the Roth treatment is specifically addressed. All right. Okay, the next area of discussion is the long-term part-time employee eligibility. Uh, and just to kind of level set for this, as, as I imagine everyone knows, the SECURE Act put in a provision that said if you had individuals who over the course of three years had 500 hours of service in each of those years, then they were required to be offered participation in the 401k plan. Uh, the counting for that started in 2001. So if you had employees who in 2000, 2021, excuse me, in 2021, 22, and 23 had 500 hours in each of those years, then in 2024, they will go into the plan. A Secure 2.0 shortened that period to two years. So it's you know still effectively the same rule, but the rule starts counting, this new rule starts counting in 2023. So if an individual has 500 hours in 2023 and 2024, they would be eligible to come into the plan in 2025. Uh, the employees uh, you know, need to be informed that they'll be eligible for the plan, uh, but they don't have to be automatically enrolled. That's something we'll discuss later, and they do not have to receive employer contributions. So they get into the plan, but they're not, you know, not necessarily reaping the full benefits. And I think that is probably just a trade-off of we want, you know, the the government wants part-time employees to be saving for retirement, but also keeping in mind that, you know, forcing employers to provide matching and profit sharing to people who may only be working, uh, you know, a couple hours a week uh, could be expensive for the employer. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that with the SECURE Act, the change was purely on the tax side. So failure to comply with it was really just a qualification issue. There's not so much of a concern on the ERISA side about you know, interfering with people's uh, benefits. Uh, SECURE 2.0 has changed that. It has added Section 202C of ERISA, uh, which provides these part-time employees with an enforcement right under the plan. So it brings these people in kind of with like you would your normal participants where they are getting both uh, the tax advantage, but also the ERISA protection. Yeah, and one thing we're talking about with respect to um, the, the long-term part-time employees is that a lot of our clients have, have moved over the course of the last decade or so to shorter eligibility requirements for full-time employees. Um, I, I just had a client move from one year of service to um, 30 days of service for full-time employees. Um, when they've done that, what, they, what they've started doing is to put in a, all other employees that are not full-time have to satisfy one year with a thousand hours before they become eligible. And so that kind of holds a lot of these folks out. Unfortunately, the Secure 1.0 and 2.0 requirements are going to do away with that kind of um, option of making them satisfy one year with 1,000 hours if they satisfy the three years or two years with 500 hours. So where this conversation has ended up going with a lot of my clients is whether we want to remove the eligibility requirement or the waiting requirement altogether for purposes of deferrals. Is it just easier to let them in for purposes of deferrals with the full-time employees um, and, and, and allow them to defer, since a lot of times that will not impact the cost structure for the employer and then still require the one year with a thousand hours um, for any employer contributions match or non-elective or, or profit sharing contributions. So when we're talking about this, we are talking about what is going to be the administrative burden of trying to track the 500 hours per year um, versus the administrative burden of just allowing them in immediately. Uh, a lot of my clients are actually skewing towards allowing them in immediately because of the difficulty in tracking the, the, the hours of service over a longer term period. Patrick, can I ask, have you come across any data or had clients ask when you're allowing part-time employees into the plan, concerns about having large numbers of small balances that 
you know, when people stop working there, either need to be cashed out, rolled over to an IRA and the administrative burden associated with that? Yeah, that that's always the, the biggest factor in, in allowing them in is what are we going to do if there are a lot of small balances? Um, fortunately, like you said, Matt, um, the, the auto enroll provisions don't have to apply to this group. So that's step one. Let's not put auto enroll in for them and, and make them affirmative, affirmatively defer. Um, step two, and this actually goes to a, a recent DOL focus that we've been kind of hammering home with our clients recently is that you need to keep up with records. Um, regardless of whether it's small balances or, or old balances, plan sponsors have a responsibility to keep up with the participants for whom they have money. So even if you have a lot of these small balances, just have a good process in place around your forced cash outs, right? Yeah, they might be in there for two or three months, but if you have a good process where you're cashing out small balances once a quarter, um, you, can, you can alleviate a lot of those issues, um, regardless of whether they're small balances or not. Absolutely in the analysis though. Great. All um, right. We're going to turn to the next polling question. I'm going to acknowledge the fact we've gotten a, a host of questions from, from the audience. Um, please keep those questions uh, rolling. We're going to attempt to get to them um, throughout the presentation. If not, uh, we're happy to regroup after the presentation and contact information is um, at the end of the slide deck. But polling question two, again, for CPE credit. Do you plan to make changes to your eligibility conditions to avoid the Secure 2.0 requirements related to long-term part-time employees? You just heard some of the complexities associated with that. Um, yes, no, or we will already allow all employees to participate immediately or very close to immediately. Um, so with that, uh, while they're still answering, why don't we turn to, I guess, sponsor focus three which is the automatic enrollment in new plans yeah and kevin even before we get there I, I can read out a couple of these questions that i'm seeing come in um one is are 403b plans treated the same as 401k plans i, I assume that's in regard to the um the catch-up contributions and the the answer is yes um uh, they they generally are treated the same the one thing i'd say is, is that 403B plans have historically allowed for some of these um, atypical type of catch-up contributions in varying limits already. So um, that, that's not changing as significantly for them. Um, the other question is, for older participants making over the 145, so they're forced into the CUC um, raw, but want to retire before five years, will they self suffer penalties and taxes for withdrawing from raw? Um, I think, I, I haven't seen any direct guidance on this. I think I, everything I've seen is yes, Matt, unless I, I missed an exception. That was, yeah, that was my thought on reading it as well, was that you, was that being forced to make Roth did not necessarily get you out of having to satisfy the other requirements for the treatment on distribution. And, and of course, they could wait, right? They could take it from the pre-tax on the front end and then kind of kind of wait to um to get to the five years before starting to take out the raw but it does add complexity uh, again like you said at the beginning that total revenue raiser to do that um, and there's going to be in, in my mind a, a lot of complexity on the back end. so all right well we will move on to automatic enrollment and new plans so starting in 2025 any plan sponsor that starts a new defined contribution plan will have to have automatic enrollment. Um, this provision added a new section 414 cap A to the Internal Revenue Code and it requires the automatic enrollment uh, to be set at a minimum of 3%. It can be set it up to 10% uh, but it is required to be no less than 3 and then to increase by 1% per year. Uh, and that increase has to be up to 10. So you can you can see kind of how, how Congress is thinking about this. They want people enrolled in plans where eventually they are saving 10% of, uh, of their plan eligible comp. Um, it can go up to 15% um, if you want to, uh, but it is required to go up to 10. 
So for those of you that are, you know, well versed in all of the various types of automatic uh, contribution arrangements that are available under the Internal Revenue Code, this is what's referred to as an IACA. It is an eligible automatic contribution arrangement. And part of what that means is, is that the, if the employee doesn't make an affirmative election, they are put into the plan, but they have a window within 90 days of the first contribution to get their money out. So the participants can always opt out. They can change, they, they can change the percentage, um, including to zero. Uh, but if they don't do anything, then those contributions will start coming out. They will increase over time. Uh, if the individual has not made uh, investment elections, then all these funds are required to go into the plan's qualified default investment alternative, which typically these days is a target date fund. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that unlike some of the other automatic contribution arrangements, this one does not automatically result in the plan passing certain non-discrimination testing. So this is not a QUACA or a qualified automatic contribution arrangement. Um, that would get you out of, I believe it's ADP, top heavy testing, uh, some other things. So you will still have to run the normal testing. And another thing to keep in mind is that the rule specifically points out multiple employer plans. So if an employer joins a multiple employer plan, um, what will happen is, is that that employer will be viewed as having, for the purposes of this rule, as having adopted a single new plan that will then be subject to, um, to these automatic contribution arrangements, even if the multiple employer plan as a whole isn't run that way. Yeah, and so if we, if we jump to the next slide, um, yeah, we, there, we have an inter, uh, intermediate slide in there about kind of the process for auto-enroll. Um, just with the, in the essence of time, we're going to jump ahead to this employer matching on student loans. So Matt, do you want to kind of walk us through what, what that re requirement is or they are? Sure. So the student loan change becomes effective in 2024. Uh, just to give a little bit of background, in 2018, Abbott Labs received a private letter ruling from the IRS that allowed them to implement a student loan repayment program that then linked into the 401k plan. Uh, the way that program worked was, was that individuals opted in. Uh, the plan normally had a 5% match if you put if you made a 2% deferral. The, the opt-in plan said, okay, well, if you make a 2% payment on your student loans, we will give you a 5% non-elective contract. Uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion in there about the technicalities of what's referred to as the contingent benefit rule, which is you can't force someone uh, to do anything to receive a contribution under a plan other than with respect to a match, obviously requiring the salary deferral. Uh, the IRS said that based on the way that, that, uh, that, that the Abbott plan was structured, that it didn't violate that. And so it kind of gave, uh, you know, sponsors, employers, I wouldn't say carte blanche, but it let them it let them know that there was a route for this. Now, obviously, everyone knows that PLRs can't be relied upon, um, but they are looked at uh, for, as as kind of guidance for how the IRS uh, might view your particular situation. Uh, now, as far as how this particular one works, is that you have to be making payments on what is referred to as a qualified, it, it's a qualified student loan payment is what you make. That looks to uh, the definition under section 221D, and that is the section that governs the student interest loan deduction on your tax return. So basically, if you're making payments on a student loan that if you met the other requirements, you would be eligible to deduct the interest, then this will, uh, this will get picked up under the plan. Uh, one important thing to note is that this is not um, an unlimited uh, ab availability here. You couldn't pay off $100,000 worth of student loans and tell your employer, I want match on $100,000. It is keyed to the 402G limit. And so as individuals make true salary deferral contributions to the plan, that reduces the amount of loan repayments that an individual can use to receive these matching contributions. 
And one thing to keep in mind, you know, we, we just discussed the automatic enrollment feature is if you've got people who become automatically enrolled in a 401k plan and they then want to use, you know, take advantage of the student loan matching, they could find themselves in a situation where, you know, they have very little or possibly no room left to make that because the automatic contribution arrangement has been putting money in and chewing up the 402g limit. And so again, there's, you know, there's little to nothing left. Yeah, and and Matt, when we've we've looked at this issue in the past, uh, pre-secure 2.0, um, I haven't had very much um, uptake on it. We were actually looking at implementing a a very very similar arrangement to the Abbott Labs arrangement pre-Abbott Labs, and so um, we were we got comfortable under a similar kind of theory of why we could do it and my client was looking at going to plr out um like abbott labs did but at the end of the day it's an increase in cost you are matching things that otherwise weren't being matched before and yes doing so might decrease deferrals and so there'd be some offset but no matter what assumptions we were putting in there um, into our modeling of the the expected cost we always saw an increase in cost. And that's something that we kept telling em employers. It's not like you can just do away with a match for these people and only give them the, the student loan match. It, it's it's that though they'd be, be eligible for both in some cases. And there would be people that were getting matched that never got it before. And so I think the biggest hurdle with this is going to continue to be the increase in cost. And, and let's be clear also, there, it's really great that we're doing this through the retirement plan and we're, we're incentivizing the, the retirement savings, but there have always been other routes to giving financial assistance to employees with student loans. Um, I, you, know, I, you can go out on the internet and find any number of examples of employers that are willing to make payments towards your student loans rather than into the 401k plan. This is a more tax efficient uh, avenue for doing it, but I just don't see it being as as popular as some other people think it will be because of the change in costs and because of the alternatives that have always been out there. Right, yeah, and, and one of the things is, you know, that, that sponsors may deal, you know, may find themselves dealing with is the way that the law, this law is written is that they're, the individual doesn't have to provide any documentation as to this, even that they, you know, that they have a loan, that they've paid the loan, this is all self-certification. So anytime you get into a self-certification situation, you start worrying about well, are people taking advantage of this, which then means you know, you're going to need, probably going to need to put in some periodic audit program uh, to be able to, you know, to pull people in and say, okay, well, you claimed this for purposes of getting the, the student loan match. We'd like to see the documentation behind that. Yep. And Matt, we have, the, um, we have a, a few more slides here, but I've seen some questions come in. So maybe we just hit this last sponsor focus, um, and then the, the slides are going to be distributed, which kind of talk about what the next steps are. Um, and we hit those very, very high level before going to those questions. Sure. All right. So our next one is the Roth treatment of employer contributions. Uh, this became effective immediately, but the uh, discussion in the you know the practicing community is is that no one's really sure how this should work or or if it really works with the law as written. Um, and so you know I have not seen anyone implement this yet. I I would imagine Patrick has not either. Um, one of the requirements here is that all of these contributions be immediately vested. So it then raises a question of, well, if your plan has a vesting schedule, are you now incentivizing people to make Roth contributions to sidestep the vesting schedule? And if as an employer, you view that vesting schedule as a retention tool because someone has to stick around for three or four years to vest in their match, uh, you know, Congress has just kind of blown a hole in that if the individual is willing to go ahead and pay tax on it in advance. Um, you know, one of the other things going on here is that, you know, okay, well, we treat the Roth, we treat the contribution as Roth. Well, employer contributions are typically not subject to FICA. Well, a large part of Secure 2.0 has been revenue raising. 
And so I think there is a question as to whether we will see a correction saying that, you know, with respect to employer contributions that are treated as Roth, we are going to take FICA out of that, which also means that the employer will have its FICA side. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind kind of from an administrative perspective is um, the idea of participants potentially mixing and matching um, these employer contributions for Roth and pre-tax. So, you know, I put, I put uh, you know, pre-tax dollars away and I say, well, I want 80% of this, 80% of my match to be pre-tax and 20% to be Roth. Well, you've now got, you know, you've got two different types of contributions, one that's supposed to be taxed up front, one that's subject to a vesting schedule. And so you, you increase the complexity of running the plan. And when you do that, you increase the likelihood of errors. Yeah. And, and, as somebody that consults um, with clients on the technical aspects of implementing these types of things and getting payroll systems and record keeping systems um, set up, um, we are telling all of our clients they should give serious consideration as to whether they wanna be early adopters. Uh, quite frankly, this one really terrifies me in trying to think about how you're gonna get up, get payroll systems re recalculated or excuse me, uh, reprogrammed to do the calculations appropriately all of a sudden i might have you know a three percent match but could go roth go could go pre-tax are we going to get sourcing right or we can get withholding right um all the issues that matt just talked about at the end of the day this is going to be there let's wait let's let the dust settle a little bit let's not try to be the first group trying to to ask people soft or ulti pro or adp or whoever program something like this. Let them get some reps under their belt and then we'll reassess. If you have client or excuse me, employees that are coming to you and really pushing for this, let's talk about it. Let's make sure that we're coaching them. They want Roth treatment on the employer side, but they're doing full on pre-tax on the employee side. They can get to the same spot by just doing the the pre-tax or Roth on the employee side and be done with it. So make sure that you're you're considering that you don't have to do this right away. Um, let's see where we, we are in a year or two and then go from there. Kevin, you want to jump into the polling question and then as we're waiting for results there, we can kind of start going through questions and final thoughts. Yeah, so polling question three is, do you plan to allow employees to elect Roth treatment for employer contributions? Yes, no, or we haven't thought about it. Um, I'll just quickly chime in and, and say, you know, Matt and, and Patrick have done a great job in highlighting um, I know we've used the word complexities a lot, but complexities associated with Secure 2.0. Um, I was looking at, you know, in preparation for this, what's the antonyms for it? And obvious simplicity, directness, ease, and clarity, um, which obviously is highlighted by these slides, um, are not present uh, in this area. And so really it's a matter of, there's a lot of decisions, a lot of moving parts. Um, I know we're gonna give some last thoughts and address some of the questions we got. Again, the contact information is at the back of the slide deck. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and with that, I guess I'll kick it over to, to Patrick to start giving yeah. some last thoughts. Yeah, and uh, Matt, I have a few questions here. Um, if you wanna jump in on some of them, feel free. First question is back to the Roth uh, required catch-up treatment. How is the 145,000 determined for self-employed individuals? Hmm. I I generally think about all self-employed when the, the compliments come in as earned income. Mm -hmm. To the extent it's truly earned income, it'll it's income for purposes of qualified plans. If it's like uh, you know distributions or dividends or or, or some other kind of um, unearned income, it generally doesn't go in. No. Yeah, I would think that would be right. Yeah, what 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 is subject to the self-employment tax? That may be what they you know that that is the FICA equivalent. Yep. Um, this is one that, that question I've seen very very frequently. Um, is the hundred and forty five thousand threshold per employer or across the control group for multiple employers? Hmm. Yeah, I looked at the statute this morning. All it says is from the employer. Um, and so it, it, it's a good question because, it, you know, you would think it would just be what was listed on the W-2 from the entity that is that is providing you that. But, you know, obviously you can have income coming from uh, other areas in the group. Yeah. And just and to so chime in, I, other, I, 
Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. I think there was also the question of, well, let's say you work for different employers outside of the group, right? So, you know, yeah. the two working for two different firms, I think there's that added complexity. And at least I'm, from what I'm hearing, there's really nothing that, that ties it all together as a per employee limit. It might be a per employer, maybe they get to a per control group, although we haven't seen that guidance. Yeah, and that's where, if I had to guess, Matt, let me know if you disagree with this. I guess that we do it at the, the control group level. We aggregate comp. Um, employer is defined to include everybody within the control group on for other purposes. So I, I'd assume that they're going to try to apply that here. I do not assume they will do it across control groups. So if I work for two un completely unrelated companies, then company A will be a, a 145 limit and company B will be a 145 limit. Yeah, I agree. I think from a practical perspective, that ha that's how it has to work because you know the employer is tracking the comp to figure out whether or not you have to do Roth if you do catch-ups. And it puts, it, you know, taking it from another, you worked at one place for six months and then you came and you're working at your new employer and the new employer says, well, we need your W-2, but we need your comp from the old employer because we need to know whether or not it's going to mess up our 401k plan. So again, yeah, I think it, I think it's going to be just from inside whatever the particular uh, control group of that plan sponsor is. Yeah. And we have similar uh, differentiation with 402G and 401A30. 402G requires the employer to track the deferral limit in their plan. 401A30 puts a, another responsibility on the employee side um, to, to track across control groups. So I could see that. Um, last one is if auto enroll doesn't apply to long term part time employees, what is the time when an auto enroll kicks in? I'd assume that it's when they become a full time employee or otherwise subject to, to auto enroll. Um, again, waiting for guidance there, um, which that that's the questions we have um and i think that last one really kind of helps to, to tie things together if, if i had kind of two things to say uh, to, to kind of wrap us up one we are waiting for a lot of guidance here and to matt's point at the beginning i would not be shocked if some of these effective dates aren't slightly changed to allow for more guidance and more implementation uh window and then two make sure that you're talking to all your providers on this ERISA council your record keeper your payroll provider because it's going to take a village to 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 get all this stuff implemented matt what did i miss there before we, we turn it over to kevin oh i think you i think you hit the nail on the head i mean there are so many moving pieces and so many fingers in this plan that everybody needs to know what everybody else is doing i mean there cannot be I don't think you can have any assumptions that someone else is handling something until you've you know, absolutely confirmed that that's what's happening. Because then you, what you don't want to end up is the situation where you've got five people all looking at each other and they're all saying, well, I thought you were, were handling it. And the conversation is, well, how do we fix the mess up in the plan? Well, well, Matt and, and Patrick, thanks so much. Uh, Kevin, we're going to turn it over to you so you could show us uh, Answer Connect not only um, hopefully where the answers currently are, but where the answers will be when that guidance comes out. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like there's a little bit of activity that's gonna have to take place in the coming days, weeks, and months here regarding all of this. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the content was outstanding. Appreciate you taking the time to put all this together for you, for us. Um, Kevin, just real quick confirmation, Answer Connect is up on screen, correct? Awesome. So in the last couple of minutes here, we're actually just going to take a look at CCH Answer Connect as it relates to some of the content that we have out here available for um, the Secure 2.0 Act. Um, first and foremost, uh, we talked about, Kevin mentioned, all of the how you're going to be kept current with this. Um, you see one of the things we offer on our tax briefing specifically related to this was the Consolidations Appropriations Act. I'm going to skip up here instead of linking on it to give you an idea. Anytime there's any significant legislation, we report on this virtually the day of or day after the uh, bill is signed into law. So the information we have here is extremely timely. It's out and it's available at the highest level, gives you that information for you to review. A um, couple of other items in terms of keeping current with this information, we do have our daily federal tax feeds, um, news feeds, where we're going to send you any information as it comes out directly to the inbox so you'll be able to see what is happening in terms of legislation and clarification in this area. So again, really important. We're going to take a look at one other area in a few minutes regarding what we can call our client impact. 
and what that tool means for you. But for right now, I want to just do a really quick search on Secure 2.0 um, to show you some of the content that we have available for you currently. Um, we spent a great deal of time creating these topic pages um, to allow you as a re researcher to be able to go in and take a look at this information specifically. Uh, you'll notice as this read defines here, the first topic page, um, this is actually our recap topic page where we talk about Secure 2.0, some of the high level implications of this, as well as continually tracking other federal legislation that's going out there. For today's example, though, I do want to jump into this required minimum distribution from the 401ks and talk to you a little bit about how we've begun to revol revolutionize and change how we're presenting this contact to you as a researcher. Um, at the mercy of the home webpage here. I'm gonna scroll up to the top and this is where we begin talking about uh, the required minimum distributions as we've heard a little bit of discussion about. We're gonna give you some really high level information here as we begin the required dates, um, how the SECURE Act 2.0 has impacted this, just to give you a baseline of information. But as you continue to work through this page, we start talking about the specifics related to how the act changed specific um, requirements related to the required minimum distributions. And we can continue to walk through all of these different topic pages. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit just to give us a little bit of an orientation here. So we are in the minimum, required minimum distribution topic page, but we also tie in many other topic pages under the 401k plans, just to allow you as a researcher to orientate yourself and then to move into other areas where the SECURE Act may impact how you are having to deal with this specific uh, issue. We also then pull in from our topic page the require, um, key primary sources. We're gonna jump back over to that in a moment, but we then also bring to you many of the productivity tools, client letters, smart charts, um, any additional news we actually bring into this document all in one place, as opposed to you as a researcher, being required to go from one page to another page to another page and having you try to put all of this together as you work through the research process of understanding this extremely complex issue uh, that's been brought up by Secure 2.0. I'm gonna go back up into my key primary source, just wanna talk a little bit about what we've done here that's different. As we go into 401 section A, what we've now done is aggregated all content related to this specific code section into a single view. So you no longer have to read the internal revenue code, go to a different database, if you will, to take a look at all of the required regulations. We've worked out this 360 view left to right across this topic, uh, these tabs that will move you through the internal, regu um, re internal revenue code into all the applicable regulations. As additional um, guidance is given, they will also be updated here into the CCH explanations, so on and so forth, cases, administrative guidance. All of this information is on the single page. You no longer have to worry about going out and finding it. The editorial team has brought it to you. So again, that's a really high level overview of the topic page and our code section 360 view and the accumulation of that data for you. One last item I did wanna take a look at before we wrap up today's session is I'm gonna go back to my search results specifically. And I'm gonna take a look at what we call our client impact tool. What we've done here is we've taken many aspects of Secure 2.0 and we've broken it down into bite-sized chunks. So do you need to deal with encouraging individuals to save? Simple SEP plans, how was that affected? Employer provided retirement plans. All of these work very similar to the topic pages that we had seen previously, where we'll walk you through the guidance, the information that you need to know to understand what this is and how to communicate that to your clients, meaning from the client application, client profile, who would be impacted, any effective dates. Again, moving into the key primary sources, any client letters that you need. All again, all of that is brought here to you in this single page, and these are put out as we have any type of legislation that takes place. So again, I thank you for giving me a couple of minutes. Uh, Margaret, I'm gonna pass it back to you uh, so we can get our final polling question taken care of. All right, well, thank you everyone. That wraps up today's webinar. Uh, we wanna thank everyone for their participation. 
As a reminder, CPE credit will be posted within two to four business days. You'll receive an email with a link to the course evaluation as well as your certificate of completion. Today's webinar has been recorded and you will receive an email with access to the link of the recording. Um, please complete the poll and thank you for attending and have a great day.